event of GBA's fifth season of the Inspired Speaker Series. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, but it, it's a lot. Thanks to Jenna Kramer, who has curated the Inspired Speaker Series um, for very many years. Yeah, give her a hand. So tonight we've got an amazing lineup about driving systemic change in communities, uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but first I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Inspire Speaker Series in general. This is the beginning, we're sort of the middle of our fifth season. Uh, a lot of you in the audience have been with us since the beginning, um, so for four years now. And we know that you have stories about how the Inspire Speaker Series has changed your thinking, your projects, your programs, your approach. Um, and we want to know those. Uh, so there's a survey, there's a paper survey that some of you picked up in the way in. There's an online survey, you can find a GBA staff member. We're really looking to tease some of these out um, in the next few weeks and really start to tell the larger narrative of why the Inspire Speaker Series is important to help us as an organization continue to bring amazing national and local speakers to this stage. So this is really important. We've heard some of these anecdotally, but we need you to make sure that you tell us. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be a small thing. Um, small things sometimes take time to grow into something larger. So go hike in GDA.org, Inspire Speaker Series survey. Let us know. There's prizes in it for you, $100 gift card, uh, one-year GDA membership, complimentary registration to future Inspire Speaker Series. So help us out so we can help you out. Also, um, we're, we usually take a break for Inspire Speaker Series in December and January because it's cold and there are the holidays, people don't like to come out because it might snow. Um, but in February, we will be back uh, on this stage with a storytelling session. Again, we did it for the first time locally last year. Many of the people in the audience said, you have to do this again. Um, so we're doing a storytelling session. We're looking for speakers. So if you have a story to tell, five to seven minutes, or if you know somebody who has an amazing story that needs to be told about loving your place, uh, February 9th here, let us know. Uh, we'll coach you through it. We'll help you be comfortable on the stage. It will be a warm and inviting audience. Um, we're looking for diverse stories, all types, about all types of places. So let us know. Also, I want to thank the uh, partners for the Inspire Speaker Series. We have very many. Uh, Fourth Economy, Chatham University, the Environmental Charter School, Forbo, the Hines and Downlands, <laughs> Hill House Association, the stage uh, we take over you know, during the school year, Homewood Children's Village, GBA's own Green and Healthy Schools Academy, the Laurel Foundation, Schweitzer Fellows, Repair the World, Sustainable Pittsburgh, Urban Innovation 21, uh, and our media partners, 90.5 WESA, 91.3 WIP, and Next Pittsburgh. All of these people help get you in the, uh, in the room and help make sure that the Inspire Speaker Series and, uh, is an amazing and inspirational place to be. Uh, also, thank you to GBA's uh, own sponsors. We're a sponsorship organization. We're also a membership organization. So if you join or renew your GBA membership tonight, you get a complimentary ticket to Inspire Speaker Series for 2017. Um, so we'll, we'll follow up with you after we do that and make sure that you get that um, as you become a GBA member. And with that, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Majestic Lane. Uh, last time Majestic graced this stage, his affiliation was with Pittsburgh Community Reinvestment Group. But today, I'd like to invite him to the stage to MC tonight as the Deputy Chief of Neighborhood Empowerment in the office of Mayor William Cuban. Majestic. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? No, 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 no. How are we doing tonight? All right, all right. Listen, it's been a rough week, right? <laughs> so, uh, one, I'm honored to be here. Uh, thank you, GPA, for um, asking me and inviting me. And, you know, coming from the, the office of the Mayor William Peduto, we want to support all the great work that's happening around sustainability and making sustainability multi dimensional and taking it from what people perceive sustainability to be that's only for certain for people and know it's a sustainability for all of us socially, culturally, economically, right? And it's important that in this kind of time that we really see what does it mean to come together, 
right? Because we, you know, tonight is about driving the systemic change in communities. And we often talk and lionize individual activity, the one person that's changing everything. But systems impact all. So how do we get past the point of acknowledging the individual, but seeing the relationship of the individual within a collective ecosystem that allows us to bring change for all? And allows us to empower all, allows everyone to feel civically engaged without going too deep into the other stuff. Let's just say that there's a deep level of civil disengagement that manifests itself in a lot of different ways. So if it's in some of our communities, in our city, in our region, this level of civic disengagement, and now we see even nationally there was civic disengagement and lack of understanding each other because people perceive systems as not working in their interests. So we want to be able to create healthy systems and systems that perpetuate the sustainability of our planet, perpetuate the sustainability of our relationships, perpetuate the sustainability of the cities and the places that we call home. You with me? Yeah. All right. So that, that's the task. We're going, and we're going to work together to do that. And these speakers, in many ways, embody that in different, not different ways in the sense of they don't do the same thing, because it's all about what are these systems and how do we connect with all and how do we build things that affect us all positively. What I want to do is um, bring up someone that I've watched from afar, uh, gotten to know her more recently, but I've watched from afar and watched her work uh, in, in many different neighborhoods and many different places around our area. Uh, Diana Bucco. Diana Bucco is the president of the Mule Foundation, where she's at the revisioning of the foundation's new strategy and process of philanthropy, including its focus on community-driven neighborhood revitalization. The foundation has embarked on a geographically focused effort in the north side of Pittsburgh known as One North South Pittsburgh, where they've engaged thousands of residents and community members to work together to define their needs and develop strategies to address them in order to improve the quality of life for all residents now and in the future. Before joining the Buell Foundation, Diana was the president of the Forbes Fund, founding executive director of the Coral Civic Center for Civic Leadership and the mentoring partnership of Southwestern Pennsylvania and the executive director of the Pennsylvania Campus Compact. She's a trustee of Point Park University and serves on the boards of Carmody Science Center, Youth Places, and Advancing Academics, Health Careers Futures, and is a member of the Women's Funders Roundtable, the United Way Women's Leadership Committee, and the International Women's Forum. And but I wanted to say on a personal level, um, being in the kind of intersection of community development, economic development, those kind of things, the work that's happening on the North Side is, I would say, the most community-driven and community-focused way that we are engaging in our city. Um, Mayors of our administration, philanthropy and dealers are calling for us to be more people-centric and people-focused and literally on the north side. They're walking and walking, talking and talking. So I'm honored to look forward to continuing to work with you. Please give us a round of applause. And so, um, what I thought I would do today is just share the story of how we ended up with One North Side and the work that we're doing in the North Side. And so, uh, for those of you who are familiar, the Buell Foundation is the oldest foundation in Pittsburgh, by far not the largest, but the oldest. And while in 1927 we were the only one in the town, we were the incubators of lots of firsts. When you fast forward to today, we're less than 2% of the total foundation giving in the region. And um, I always have a moment of pride when I hear people say the foundation as a historically significant foundation because our credit doesn't come from our resources. It comes from the contributions we've made. And it's that legacy that uh, I feel very uh, responsible for carrying forward. So um, the, the foundation asked if we're less than 2%, maybe there's a better way to do our job. 
Maybe rather than being a regional multi-purpose foundation, we can make, it, make an impact by being focused and more strategic. And um, they, they thought, maybe the north side. Mr. Buell made his fortune there. He lives, works, and is buried in Allegheny Cemetery. And when you think about the, what's happened in Pittsburgh, I think we would all agree that collect the, at the big picture, it's tipped for the better, right? And when you think about hmm, neighborhoods with proximity to the urban core who should be benefiting, Northside ought to be one of those neighborhoods. Um, and yet, when we think about the Northside from the River to the city border, some parts are, some are actually going backwards. And so the question became for Buell, can we have an impact to maybe help try to, to ensure that the Northside is one of our communities that have equal access to the benefits of a changing economy. And, and the board, to their credit, in 2013, January 2013, asked me if I would come and answer three questions. Should they take on a place-based focus? If the answer is yes, what and how? And what would be the redistribution of resources? And um, I, we laugh about this now because the board also said to me, and if we like what you come up with, it's a succession strategy. And if we don't, well, it's not. And we can't guarantee you work after that. And again, <laughs> And again, as a social entrepreneur, right? It's right. Entre what? Who's not going to love it, right? So it didn't even occur to me. And we laugh about it. I'm like, we really did talk about that. So um, when I got there in January 2013, I sort of said, look, um, one, who are we to decide what happens in the North Side? You know, we got to ask North Siders what's important to them. And that two, we have to work from an asset base. And assets are defined first as people then places, and last resources. And the two, for foundation, the opportunity that we have is to put people in a position to create the change they want to see in their lives and in their communities. So armed with that, in the first year, we interviewed 400 people. And what's important about that conversation is we never once asked people what's wrong with their community. We said, why do you live here? What do you love about your community? If resources weren't an issue, what would you change? And finally said, what do you think fundamentally we all need to live with dignity. What do you think are the basic elements that we all ought to have? And what we didn't expect was that, that what that did was allow 18 very historically siloed neighborhoods, and you're all familiar with the North Side, right? So um, not historically known for cooperating, right? Uh, to have a shared vision and to begin to dream about what they wanted for their community. And as we were, and in that first year with those 400 folks, as we were doing that, we were collecting every publicly available data point on the north side. And this really cool thing started to happen. This overlap between what the residents were telling us was important and what the data was telling us. And it took literally five minutes to realize that the most powerful asset in the north side were its people. And I would say all the time, it's the secret sauce. They're the most passionate. There isn't a neighborhood that you go to where people aren't spending their days trying to make their neighborhood better. They really want this. And so place for them is in their DNA. They're the most diverse. 50% Caucasian, 40% African American, 5% other. And we all know in Pittsburgh that is the diversity, right, unfortunately. Um, but when you look at those 18 neighborhoods other than Manchester and um, Northview Heights, they're integrated. So the majority race is not more than 80%. Most are 60, 40, and it changes by neighborhood. So while most of Pittsburgh, as we all know, have issues around integration, Northside's an integrated community. And the people who live there live there because they want to and because they love their community. And we understood that if we could mobilize that, we could create the transformative agenda that those residents were telling us that they wanted. The other thing that we understood, and it again, this was in the first to, I would say four weeks. I came back to the office one day and um, remember I was the vice president at that point and I, you know, I don't want to come off as this soft wimpy woman so I said hey you know I'm not touchy feely but I know what the first step in the strategy is and, my, and Fred Tiemann who you all know who's amazing he said what die and I said hope and he looked at me like I was off my rocker <laughs> and I said look it's about people fundamentally believing that their condition can change. I said, and what I understand from that is that if we as a foundation are going to do that, we can't make a commitment for three to five years and change our mind. This is a 20-year strategy. And then for, first, after I said it to him, I went like this. I actually said it first, this is a 10 to 20-year strategy. Because <laughs> I figured at that point they were going to fire me, right? <laughs> and they didn't. And Fred was like, what? What? And I'm like, bear with me on this, right? But we understood that, that that was the first 
and, and most vital step in this. And, um, so, and, that, and then the other thing we did was work closely with our board because what we understood about really doing, a, a, about really creating sustainable communities is that every partner at the table has to humble themselves to leave their agendas at the door and make the commitment that was, that was ultimately in the best interest of everybody. And that meant the foundation too. So I spent a lot of time talking with my board about what it meant to be an embedded philanthropist, to walk side by side with the people, and not the institutions, not the nonprofits, and I can say that because I was an executive director for 25 years, right? It wasn't about the nonprofits, it was about the residents. And how do we walk side by side and allow what they tell us to drive the agenda? So the really cool thing was at the end of that first year when I told you we heard about all that overlap, everybody kept saying to me, Di, this is so cool. Or they would say, wow, the first thing people in the North Side would say to me is, thank you for asking. Nobody ever asks. And then the second thing they said was, and we want to know what you find out, right? The third thing they did was tell me what they thought about everybody, but that was cool. I'm like, wow, they don't even know me, but they, it was like, right? The class. So I know all the skeletons and all the secrets. No. But, um, but what they, what, uh, so we gave our word, right? So as you think about this, I want you to hear some things. We gave them our word, and we knew we had to follow through on it. And we said, we, I said, I can't guarantee you will do this, but I give you my word, we will let you know what we learn. So at the end of that first year, it was an over, overwhelming, we should do this. So we said, fine, well, we're gonna, that's great. Uh, February, so the start of January 13, February 14, we invited, Everybody from the north side who we'd met with to come and hear what we learned. So it was about 200 people, because the other 200 were stakeholders and corporate leaders. See, not corporate, but um, civic leaders in our community. And um, of those two, of the 187, 140 said they were coming, and another 40 showed up because the word was out. And we shared with them what we learned. And we said, did we? And we then we created an environment where we said, did we get this right? What did we miss? What else should be here? And from that, um, we got this great feedback. And what we heard from folks, none of this I think will surprise any of you, that the three core themes were grounded in quality of education, quality of place, both where you live in the environment around you, and quality of employment, the ability to provide for yourself and your family. And then the three sub-themes that we heard constantly were around safety, we're around transportation, and we're around food. And I have to tell you with the issue of food, as, a, as, as you know, the, the, the daughter of Italian immigrants, the thought that children weren't eating was unbearable. And what we were learning was that children in the North Side couldn't learn on Fridays because they were hungry and the anxiety, on the anxiety of a weekend without eating. And then they didn't start to settle again till noon on Monday because they would eat and then sort of get into that, you know, food coma, the itis, is, is one of my colleagues calls it, and then not, um, not really start learning again. So our kids were learning a day, losing a day and a half of education because they were hungry right there, right? So, um, but what we also understood were those three, food, transportation, safety, their symptoms. They're not root causes. And as a tiny foundation, we could put every penny into that and not make a dent. What we needed to do was go after systemic change that was anchored in those three core strategies of, of, of housing, um, education, and employment. Now, in saying that, we're, we're, we're running a backpack program. 1,800 kids every Friday are going home with a bag of food. So we had to do that because we couldn't have kids go hungry. But we're using that as one of the outlets to reach families so we can start to address the bigger issues. Um, so that's what evolved in the strategy. But to make sure we had it right, we spent another year Another from February to December, we had 500 people, about 150 core from all 18 neighborhoods, meeting with us monthly, helping us to flush out a strategy around those three big areas. And then quarterly, 500 who would come and give us their opinions. And then we wanted to make sure we had this right a little bit more, so we did what we called a North Side Census, 70 question survey around those topics. And, and a little bit more. And we hired, if you think about the north side as the flats, the middle, and the hilltop, your middle is where our, if you, you can look at it, it's amazing on the map, directly across it's where our lowest income residents live. So we hired 16 north siders from those neighborhoods and trained them to be census takers with iPads. And they went door knocking on their neighbor's doors. And then we used voter data because we know they're the most 
disenfranchised. Because we want to make sure we got everybody's voice. And we want to understand how these issues impact them and if they were the right ones. So by the end of that second year, we had a plan that we were very confident was um, really and truly reflective of the residents of the north side. And what we understood was that for us, we can leverage, be a leverage of resources. We can be a connector of diverse neighborhoods, of opportunity to the downtown core, and that we had to invest as a foundation because we're tiny. We don't have enough to make a dent in anything, honestly. Um, it's about between three and eight million a year. The issues we're talking about can't do anything, but we can invest in what becomes catalytic because it's 20 years, because it's an incremental change, success will bring success, and we're going to begin to incubate innovative solutions in the north side that we can then roll out to other communities. Um, and so what we started talking to residents about in the north side, we said, look, we know there are things you can do. Go ahead and do it. You don't have to wait for us. And we put out in that first year about a half a million dollars in mini grants. $1,000 grants, 50 of them, for anybody who wanted to do anything for their community that supported the plan. So we had urban gardens, we had play dates, we had mosaics, and we used heat maps, right? So what do you think happened? Better resource communities came out first, lesser resource communities. So no, we're, we're slower to the table. Nobody got a no. Everybody got an almost. So we used it as a way to build up community capacity. In neighborhoods that weren't applying, we, we moved into them, started knocking on doors and asking them to be part of this and to come up with solutions for their communities. We then guaranteed 18, a, a $10,000 grant to every neighborhood. We said, you're not competing for the dollars, but you do got to build consensus and agreement on what you're going to work on and got resources in the neighborhoods they can do that. And then those folks who worked with us for a year, we felt we had to respect them. So we guaranteed them 150000 and said, you decide how you're going to spend it. They came up with 14 projects. And do you know what's so powerful? Not a single one of that, those dollars went toward overhead or salaries. They were all for projects because those, they were resident-driven projects that people owned and were very proud of. So, um, and then we said, there are things we can do as a foundation that will be systemic in nature. And that's what we've begun to work on. So we're pushing ecosystems around, so that around early childhood, around after school, because Majestic is absolutely right. The ecosystems that are designed for families to thrive are not working. And this shouldn't be about economics. Anyone should be able to thrive regardless of how much they earn. And so we're pushing, Buell is pushing the systems to create the kind of changes that will enable people to thrive. And I'm running out of time, so that I want to give you um, just two examples of how that works. Because not only do we have to build the ecosystem, but we have to make sure that we create equal access to the benefits of a changing economy. So what does that look like? Um, there is in the north side Nova Place today. And uh, I had brought a video. We're not going to see it, because we won't have time. But uh, so I don't mean to disappoint you up there. Uh, but. Um, Nova Place in the north side, which is where Old Allegheny Center Mall is, there's a real cool, hip, accelerator, co-located space there. And the last year, we've worked with two nonprofits in the north side to um, incubate entrepreneurs who have business ideas from the neighborhoods. 23 neighbor residents have come up with businesses that they're building. Most of them are you know, more maker businesses, right? Restaurants, shops, making things. They are now ready to go to the next level. They are going to be placed in that co-locator space in Alloy 26 with all the cool hipsters from CMU with equal access to all of the benefits. And then we're going to hire a, an expert who's going to do next stage business development with them that's specifically around the kind of businesses. So all of a sudden now, right, because our, our habit unintentionally is we'll put these projects over here and we're going to put those over there and the two never interconnect. And the real solution to equal access is making sure that we do integration rather than, than, than sub segregating things. And so everything we do now in the north side is about creating this kind of intersection between the residents and the opportunities that are available. And what Buell has committed to doing by doing this 20-year process, you know, I, I, I get the scars, right? Because it's, people get angry. People are hurt. One thing goes wrong and all the trust, distrust comes out, right? But what's going to matter isn't that all that happened. What's going to matter is we come back the next day. And it's that gradual process with 
brilliant execution and relentless attention to the details that's going to create the kind of systemic change that we all want to see. And so that's what, um, and, and not only is it systemic, systemic change, but it's how you create sustainable communities because, you know, I said I only, 10% is what I need today because 10% are ready to be bold and take that risk, right? It doesn't matter what the project is, but if we nail it, the other 10% that's like this, right, doesn't dare get too hopeful, they're going to go, wow, that's, they, they're just like me. I'm going to take that step. And gradually, this is going to happen. That's the way that the Buell Foundation today is approaching sustainable communities and trying to work side by side with residents to create the kind of change so that 20 years from now, we'll have two big outcomes. The quality of life of every Northside resident that lives there today will improve and that it's once again a community that everybody wants to go to, not only to live, but to visit and to ride bikes and to do really cool things. So that's the transformative agenda that Buell is aspiring to do, and in that, create a sustainable community. Thank you. And I just want to say, uh, preface to the video, I really am the president, because it's, it's, um, I just took over July 1, and Fred is, it, it lists Fred as the president, but um, just wanted to let you know that. The Buell Foundation is Pittsburgh's oldest multi-purpose foundation. And over the years, we've had the pleasure of starting some things you'd recognize as part of Pittsburgh. The Buell Planetarium, Chatham Village, Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. But in recent years, we've been wondering, is there a way we could be even more impactful with our giving? And that led to a focus on Pittsburgh's north side. So in 2013, we embarked on a process to see how we could be more innovative with our giving. And we asked the question, does it make sense for the Buell Foundation to take on a place-based strategy? The Buell Foundation organized the census, and I joined with them, and I hit the streets. We wanted to seek the real answers from families who are experiencing it at its worst. You can see the collaboration and the excitement, and again, the vibrancy and enthusiasm people have in the North Side. The census, it did something different. They know their community matters, they know they matter. And they opened up to us and they believe we really are in this together. Strategy teams have met for seven months with a variety of stakeholders, neighbors, and community and business leaders to gain a consensus for the North Side. We soon learned that there were three core issues. They were anchored in quality of education, quality of place, and quality of employment. These strategy teams have now become action teams. The thing that I believe is one of the most important things for us to work on is education, and it must start early. I don't believe you can educate children without working with the family. And so we talk all the time about uh, it takes a village to raise a child. I think that's actually true. And it takes all of us to come together to help these families to become stronger. As a community, we can really help those that are in need to make it a better place. Education is the ticket for our kids to get to where they need to go. That people want to not only live there, work there, but also get educated there. I believe the, the impact of this initiative is going to bring jobs. There are a variety of initiatives that we would like to expand on to connect teens with businesses and organizations. Connecting the residents of the North Side with local businesses will help the community flourish from the inside and out. There's a lot of people who do want to work and have good jobs. So we're going to help them find jobs and keep them. The quality of place brings the most potential because the Buell Foundation believes that that's what brings together residents, educators, and businesses. Right now, the North Side is a place where people who live here are proud to live here. The North Side is the crown jewel of the city of Pittsburgh. What we want to do is make people aware of that, make people who want to invest in the North Side aware of it. These are all the things that make people want to live in the city. Quality of place is what ties those all together. Quality of place is so important to the Buell Foundation because it's our legacy. Henry Buell had his department store here, and he wanted to make sure that those assets stayed here in the community. The potential of the north side is something everyone feels and everyone just is so, so hopeful for success. That would really be more wonderful than people may even realize at this point. I feel a strong connection as an individual and as an official to what the north side can be. The potential of building upon what has been handed to us and putting a little bit of the secret sauce of innovation into it makes it a limitless potential. We're going to create a spiraling series of upward 
that gives people confidence and gives people the strength to understand that they can make decisions that will improve their communities. Our commitment to the north side is that we're going to be here for another 80 years supporting the place that we call home. We're making the north side beautiful, clean, green, and a wonderful place to live. We are making the north side exciting. More livable. Outstanding. The best place to work. We're making Northside our home to live, work, and play. The better place to live. A better place to learn. We're making the Northside world class. A place to be proud of. A wonderful place to live. We're making Northside one community. So um, before I start reading about the bio of um, Sister Naomi Davis, I want to, as I was reading over it earlier and thinking about it, and thinking about like sustainability and what it means to be green, um, you know, we're breaking past some of those barriers, but traditionally when we said what does it mean to be green, it has become something that's only for a certain group of people, right? And then I realized, well, what it meant for my grandmother to be green was that she had cucumbers in the back, she had peppers, right? And almost <laughs> three quarters of the families of the folks that I knew in the neighborhood, and it was distinctly urban, had these things. Or it meant living off the land and being resilient, and understanding those things. So I think that is one of the biggest things that we can do is kind of crack that code of not thinking about sustainability as tied to race or class, but about the resilience of how do we move forward as a country and how to move forward as a planet. I think that if anything you hear from me tonight is really how do we do that and how do we do it in a systemic way and not a one-off way and not a one-year way and not a one-program way, but a way that we know that this is, this is the new normal for our city and our communities. Um, so often referred to as a visionary, Naomi Davis is nationally recognized for her work to engage and empower the African-American community in health, sustainability, and economic opportunities. An urban theorist, attorney, activist, and proud granddaughter of Mississippi sharecroppers, Naomi founded and serves as the CEO of Blacks and Green, an award-winning economic development organization based in West Woodlawn, Chicago. BIG is a national sustainability network and community wealth building initiative with the vision of creating self-sustaining black communities everywhere. Through advocacy and programs, she conveys the risks of global warming, the health and wealth opportunities of the new green economy, the power of neighbor-led neighbor environmental economic policy and practice, local living economies as greenhouse reduction and wealth building strategies, and the primacy of land ownership. Toward narrowing America's racial disparities and ushering in the age of the neighbor investor, Naomi trains activists and everyday neighbors to lead where they live in establishing walkable villages from the city of villages, where every neighbor household can walk to work, walk to shop, walk to learn, walk to play. Biggs West Woodlong Botanic Garden and Village Farm Initiative is their sustainable square mile pilot. Um, and before I bring up, I think that's also important that urbanism is not the domain of any particular community, but everyone deserves urbanism. Everyone deserves to be able to walk to things that are important to them. Everyone deserves to see green space. And we have to expand our definitions and really bring it back to urbanism and not just you know small spaces of neighborhoods. So with that, I'd like to bring up Naomi Davis. Thank you. Here we go, here we go. Greetings, cousins, how y'all doing? All right. I am, um, first of all, I know why you call it Inspire now. That work is just amazing. I've often said, commitment comes first. And that's what uh, we just saw a supreme demonstration of. Without that in place, stuff happens, but does it really make a difference, okay? We're calling tonight's talk, Follow the Money. Some of you will recognize that. Some of us of a certain age 
And um, what we're really uh, getting at here is that there is a need to level the playing field and uh, build community wealth. So um, these are the things that I'm going to be talking about, would like to feel you taking away. The fact that we're pioneering this thing we call the city of villages and the sustainable square mile. Uh, that we're teaching a whole system uh, problem can only be solved by a whole system solution. Um, and, uh, and that the black community has a whole system problem that's common everywhere, common everywhere you go. That we're de-emphasizing, in point of fact, our ancestors spent a lot of time talking about segregation and making it move. But when you have uh, structural racism, even if you're uh, one little pepper kernel in a sea of salt, structural racism will find you, will it not? Talk back to me now. Okay. So um, we also uh, wanted to make sure that the um, idea that by black, for black, driven by black communities is honored. What we see too much of, the formula that hasn't worked, is the help the Negro industry you know, where everyone across town gets the funding and in their blessed, beloved commitment to the work, they come across town and help. And the capacity of those they're helping uh, doesn't get built in the process. So we're, we're trying to make sure that we recognize the value of self-help. Didn't everybody's grandmother teach them that? So um, by the same token, what is it that your allies across the bounds of race and class can provide. How do you invest that privilege you inherited to advance the work of self-help of others? It, can you get that? Okay. Uh, the idea that we are enshrining land ownership. Up till now, I've always said nothing trumps ownership of the land. Don't like using that word so much. <laughs> um, but uh, we're going to survive. We're going to thrive, as a matter of fact. Um, designing policy to launch the age of the neighbor, investor, and developer. There is a need for people in the community to develop their own community. Because the idea that there's a magical person across town who has something that you don't have, well, the only thing actually is cash. Okay, cash cures a multitude of things. So just give the cash to the people who live in the place to develop it themselves. Let's see what happens when we do that. And that is based on policy, by the way. So, if we do these things that we're talking about, and this is an experiment, and what we heard just now is that it is an experiment laden with the opportunity to fail. Do we know, is it a lock, is it guaranteed? No. But by the grace of God and by the grace of our cousins, as we do the process, we can forgive, we can tweak, we can work it out on the ground. And so when we talk about measuring our results by an increase in household income, what we want you to take away is that, look, if economic development is not increasing the household income of the people who live in the place that you're helping, come on, y'all, right? It's not just me, right? You can, okay, all right. And so when we say that we want to design a new discipline, I just want to put it in this context. We work with a lot of urban planners. We work with a lot of architects. We work with a lot of municipal professionals who are brilliant, lovely, great, and yet when, um, when our kids get out of school and they have a burning desire, God bless them if they came out with a burning desire. How do they activate themselves? How do they get in the flow of things? Let's, and I'm, and I'm proud to say, and so geeked and excited that uh, I'll be working uh, with, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but uh, I'll just say it, Tennessee State University, uh, to uh, work on what it would be like 
to have a cohort of students come through as undergrads with enough training to go out in place and do what we call green village building. Uh, let's see if you recognize any value in that as we go. And so um, as we are working with partners like you, and trust me, it is so humbling and it is an honor. We've got folks like Fred Brown and uh, is Hallie here tonight? Hallie in the house, okay. And Christine Mondor, are you here? Um, we just recognize that there's a great amount of great work being done on the ground. We wanna be your partner in that. And if you see something in what we're doing that uh, can elevate, amplify, deepen, accelerate, or otherwise produce the results that you're looking at, especially for communities of color, let's dance, okay? All right, so now I'm gonna tell you a little story, and it goes like this. I am Naomi Davis, and I come from white gloves and mud, proud granddaughter of Mississippi sharecroppers, who, like so many millions of Americans in America's greatest underreported story, moved up south, as they say, for freedom and economic opportunity in the 100-year anniversary of this thing we call the Great Migration happens to be this year, 2016, six million African Americans voted with their souls and their feet, their souls and their feet, and got gone in pursuit of a higher, way forward. And so uh, my family, which you'll see, um, my aunts and uncles uh, on the far left, uh, my great-grandmother, my grandmother, and my mom, born and raised in Minner City, Mississippi, Mississippi Delta, 60 feet of topsoil. You spit and something will grow. Very, very rich, but by the same token, a hundred years later, neighborhoods like this one where I grew up in St. Albans, Queens, are dying on the vine from the same seed of genius that landed there in those years, in those decades. How did that happen? How did we go from the wisdom of our grandmothers? How did we move so that these 12 propositions, and one of my favorites is everyone must work. Y'all remember that? Mm-hmm. And then, of course, Chicken poop makes great fertilizer, and we're proving that to be true every day. How did we go from this deep level of wisdom, and how did we fall so far from grace? This is actually my grandmother, Adelia Thompson Siggers, and when I say I come from white gloves, can you see what I'm talking about? I mean, I have a picture of my grandmother right beside Michelle Obama, okay? Because this dignity, you can't buy it, and you can't kill it same as our beloved First Lady. So this is what it looked like. The Choctaw Indians oppressed people, turn around and oppress the people who came uh, after them. The, um, the idea that there was justice, well, there's the courthouse behind the cotton bales. And in the process of moving, as we say, up south, Many hundreds of thousands landed, uh, many millions actually in Chicago, and many, many families landed in a place called West Woodlawn, which is where I live and work today. So you'll see our little garden sign, and you'll see the famous Jacob Lawrence painting uh, that signifies uh, kind of where we came from and where we find ourselves today. That's where this picture comes in. That's what that place looked like when I moved into the neighborhood, and that's what it looks like today. It was the result of the work of neighbors. And we're trying to work with this metaphor right now of the human body, the respiratory systems, the, the nine or 12 systems in the body, and how the neighborhood, the village, the workings of the village, the layers of activity, the roles that people are playing are like the body. And right now, we want to be able to say that the green infrastructure that uh, is an important part of the work we're doing is like uh, the respiratory or the lungs of the system. So um, many years ago, one of the people who left the South was a woman named Mamie Till. You see where I'm going? Okay, that's the house where she settled. 
6427 South St. Lawrence. Bought and sold in a shambles. Nobody knew what it was. Nobody cared. No sense of history. No, there should be a perpetual flame in front of this house. And the person who just sold it didn't even know what it was. That family, that love of the South, that sending your child home, that result that we know changed the course of a country from a little town in Money, Mississippi, and that's our play on words for tonight. Follow the money. My mother was raised 30 miles from money. I live three blocks from where Emmett Till left West Woodlawn that fateful summer. And of course, that was what happened then when a jury of uh, 12 white men took 67 minutes to decide that uh, you know, these gentlemen were innocent after they ran through the Tallahatchie River, after they ran through the rice beds, and uh, this was the result. And this was the result. And this was the result. The canker worm got money's store like it will kill us all. How do we want to rem be remembered? What's our legacy? So in that vein, I've created a piece called The Suitcase, where I'm a young lady who comes up from the South. Remember, storytelling. What is our story? What is the narrative? Are we making America great again? Or is there some other way that we want to express who we are, what we're committed to, and where we're going? This tells the story of a woman who lived 100 years and died, God rest her soul, on the morning of November 8th, 2016, before the election results came in. Having voted twice, rest her soul for the first African-American president of these United States. And what she brought with her from the South were the seeds from her farm. And seeds tell the story forward. Literally, figuratively, we've been planted. In the context of where we've been planted, with the field that we're growing up in, note this work by Professor Trisha Rose of Brown University. Structural racism rules. Structural racism rules. And so when you have this interlocking system, it's, and it is a system, it's a whole system, and, and she's doing some very exciting work. I suggest you look at her video online. We've got a whole system problem, as we say, common to black communities everywhere. Does it seem familiar? And the travesty that gets compounded, literally, is the taking of the land. When people, for example, landed in North Lawndale, when they came up during the migration, they found that uh, they were uh, subject to contract buying. Do we, under, do we understand that practice? Does anyone know what that meant? That meant that they, they had the very worst combination of a, of a lease and a mortgage. They didn't have any equity all the while that they were paying exorbitant inflated rates that were um, conspired to um, to exist by the judges, the lawyers, the realtors, the appraisers, the insurance companies. There is a system at work. I know this isn't happy news. You should see your faces. I know that this is not happy news. But until we confront this, until we recognize this, this is what has to be dismantled. Because what do you think the too big to fail was all about? Well, we got away with it once. There's a massive exchange of wealth because if you, if you paid your uh, uh, um, payment on time for however many years, 10 years, and you missed the last payment, you lost your building. Um, this is the world that I live in, the University of Chicago, the world of the haves. You could stow a throne, throw a stone to this other building. Why are we living in bifurcated societies like this? What is gentrification? Where does it come from? It's not an accident. Again, it's part of this system, but a system that comes from policy can also be dismantled by policy. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay. And so 100 years later, from the beginning of the Great Migration, they called it the Exodus, this is what we're looking at. 
On the left-hand side, all of those green dots are city-owned lots that are vacant. How can we help level the playing field and build community wealth by making sure that neighbors get to be the investors, the owners, the developers of that property? Not some guy with some special sauce across town who's going to magically do something that neighbors can't do, right? So instead of looking at how we can cultivate our organizations, you know, seven is the end of a phase, but where are we going to be 100 years from now? Can we think about that? You've been uh, brilliant enough to think about 20 years. I know it probably makes anyone's head hurt to think about, well, how can I plan for 100 years? Well, some people do. And so uh, we applaud the city of Chicago for their $1 large lot program. And not every lot is in the program, but many of them are. And again, let's see what story we're going to tell. I come from the age of Martin and Malcolm, and I came up with a whole different narrative of what's possible than what's prevailing right now. What if the narrative was, we live in a city of villages where every household can walk to work, walk to shop, walk to learn, and walk to play? Wouldn't that be groovy? <laughs> And so only a whole system solution can transform a whole, the whole system problem common to black communities everywhere. Look, what's good for the African diaspora is good for everyone. And what's bad for the African diaspora is bad for everyone. You cannot have climate justice without economic justice. I'm just planting these seeds with you so that we can make sure we're pushing a vision that will allow people to flourish rather than perish. So here's the question of the century. Where is your village? Where is your village? We want to begin our process almost with any neighborhood that we're talking with or any activist that we're uh, coaching or inciting or listening to for understanding. We want to know where's the place where you live around which, within walking distance, are the things you love and need. And if, uh, so it's an exercise that we do, and on the front, you put a little heart where your house is, and then you write down everything that's within walking distance. Say it's the sustainable square mile. And then on the back, you turn it over and write what's missing. And that's where the eight principles of green village building came from, the idea that there was a whole system solution that there was a operating unit for implementation called the sustainable square mile. Who got a business card? Who got a big business card? And did you look on the back where the eight principles? So you always can kind of be checking out with yourself. Is this true? Is it not true? Does it vibe with me? Um, each of these are slides that we're going to make available. We're going to invite you into uh, sit-downs and talks and uh, imaginings because we believe that what we have uh, uniquely pulled together is a system that can benefit everybody, African-American communities as well as others. We're looking at the greenhouse gas reduction strategy because when Big was born in 2007, our greenhouse gas levels were 370 parts per million and everyone from corporations to kindergartners were rallying to reduce carbon and pollution from other sources and right now we're beyond the tipping point at 402 parts per million. How do we create a walkable village as a greenhouse gas reduction strategy? Well, these are some of the core moving parts of that process. So I'm going to walk with you a little bit through each of the eight principles to show how programs that we have done, you know, it's not for me to say what program you should do. It's an experiment. What do you think might be relevant regarding wealth? That each village has its own measures, exchanges, and repositories of wealth. Because if you look at how wealth is defined, 
it's an exchange of agreed value, okay? What are you, what are you exchanging? You're exchanging something that, had, that was created with skill. Again, skill. Here's a sample from the Transition Town Handbook, okay? Does your walkable village have people who can do those various things? Do you have a sustainable square mile? Can you birth a child, fix an engine, play a cello? I mean, how sustainable is the place where you live? When we, when we began looking at the first principle in a program we could do, here's an experiment that failed. Crowdfunding. We wanted to have our own crowdfunding site. Well, crowdfunding works in a lot of different ways. And, and there are people uh, building wealth using that vehicle today. This was a little app that we created for our village. Have you seen the Larimer app? It's amazing, isn't it? Our app never got to the other side, but again, it's thinking, it's working, it's how you put together th tools that are important, okay? The second principle, each village produces its own energy for light, heat, and transportation. Well, way back years ago, we began a process of trying to teach our community, uh, engage our community, have our community imagine what renewable energy would be like for uh, the place where they lived. All these many years later, we just came through a brutal legislative session where uh, our local utility is instead of propping up uh, and supporting and subsidizing renewable energy, is focusing on subsidizing coal and nuclear. It's a process. Each village supplies all basic goods and services to neighbors, converting waste to wealth in the process. Well, there's a book called the Jemima Code. We know that the home economy is the first economy. We had an experiment that we did regarding the herbs that we grew and whether we could do an infused olive oil. And of course, you see Granny's label there. The question of start with what's in your hand. What, are you, what have you got? What are you... What are you mobilizing, okay? The fourth principle, you know, each village is, a, uh, is sustained through jobs-driven development without displacement, providing low-income housing and producing high-quality food through land trust CDCs. Right now, we have a, uh, on the boards a federation of community land trusts, like the size of the north side. Each community looking at how they can build their own sustained affordability across generations by creating a network of land trusts. Uh, we created the West Woodlawn Botanic Garden and Village Farm Initiative where we were asking and answering four questions. How many households could we feed? How many neighbors could we train and engage? How many jobs or businesses could we create? And how many gallons of stormwater could we divert? And in the process of asking those questions, looking at what kind of hardscapes do we want to build? What kind of urban homesteading do we want to have our neighbors engaged in? And so we began having a homesteaders fair where um, neighbors could come and learn about conservation lifestyle, which we call the beautiful life, and also weigh in on what kind of homes they wanted to have. And as a result, and here's your invitation, we're having our first Green Village Building Summit uh, next September, Labor Day weekend, at the African Festival of the Arts. And the idea that we can build homes that are affordable to middle-income families, that have um, the conservation lifestyle embedded into the design, and that are uh, designed specifically for the types of families that are prevalent in our neighborhoods, please uh, come and join us with others who are doing great systems-based work like this from around the country. We have, uh, in our green infrastructure process, used our First Lady's book as kind of like our Bible. And um, if you haven't seen it, it's gorgeous, it's good for kids, it's good for grannies, 
And of course, where we live, and I, let me see if I can, is the thingy working? Where it says Parkway Gardens over there, that's one of the areas where uh, our First Lady Michelle Obama spent part of her childhood. We live in an historic neighborhood, not just Emmett Till, Lorraine Hansberry, our First Lady, and the reason that this is divided up into zones like this is because we're looking at how to create um, trained teams of land stewards in each of those zones who will account for the trees, the trash, the backyard gardens, the, um, the competitions, the, the neighbors who are uh, wanting to learn how to uh, put uh, grow plants inside their houses, everything that grows and wherever we want to see people growing it, we want to have teams on the ground who can coach and support our neighbors in learning how to do that. This is what our quote unquote square mile, I know it's not square guys, but it is essentially eight blocks by eight blocks and um, this is another way of looking at it. In the context of the things that are going on around us, you see we've got the University of Chicago, we've got different urban ag zones around us, and uh, we, we are working to cultivate uh, from the bottom up, from, from the grassroots. Um, this is kind of what the, the vision uh, has evolved into over a few years of uh, green healthy neighborhood uh, uh, process. And the idea that we have a land use planning vision, it's a vision that people can, um, you know, uh, think about the placement and the cultivation of their commercial corridors along, along the way. When we talk about the kinds of jobs and businesses we can create, this is just a sampler of the kinds of things that can be grown, value added, manufactured, or otherwise contributed within the context of a botanic garden and village farm. We've done surveys door to door. Again, uh, we have students going out right now who are asking uh, questions about of our neighbors, how they feel about a community benefits agreement, how they feel about community land trust, how they feel about what kinds of features they want in the homes that we're going to be building. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a, uh, a sampling, again, not uh, definitive, but a place to start. When we talk about green infrastructure, just the point of putting this garden in place at the gateway of the neighborhood has caused people to move into the neighborhood, have called people to say, oh, people must care who live around here, I think I'll give this place a look. This is what our second property looked like when we first started. And that kind of, what is that, the Bigfoot or what is it, <laughs> is one of, one of our team members picking trash. And I'll tell you, in the four years since we started, re, the litter has been reduced by over 95%. People just don't do it when they see that you care and something is possible. And this is just part of what it looks like today. And these are some of our young gardeners as well. Uh, we uh, want to talk about the muscular system of how we get stuff done. And it really is in using the um, anatomy, it is the muscle of neighbors coming together. It is our young folks. It is our babies, okay? The backyard garden is critical to the opportunity for neighbors to produce their own food, okay? Ownership, when we teach people, right now we had about a 16% a ownership of our, uh, of our neighbors by, uh, by people who live in the neighborhood, how can we transform that? What metrics are we going to use? We don't want to be colonized. The flip of a switch, those rents can change overnight and everybody is gone. Okay, that's complete vulnerability. 
And so these are the kinds of studies, data that you will see, toolkits that are out there, part of the things that we work with, use, refer to, share. This is the uh, West Harlem Community Benefits Agreement, 60 pages with a 200 page appendix. But you got to research. You got to read and see what's being done, what's working. Is it working? And so when we talk about changing the game, we want to always be pointing to best practices. And, and that's part of what we've been doing with the workbook that we'll be sharing with folks that we uh, work with uh, in the morning. We're inviting you to come and see about being a cohort. Instead of tearing down, building up and tearing down communities. And this is how it goes. This is the cycle. Instead of investing in those cycles, oh yeah, it's easier to just tear it down now. What about the gentrification that is happening, Boston, 61%, Seattle, 55. These, these are real people, real families. Who cares where they go? They're just priced out. Chicago. And so when we talk about the stories, we want to we wanna share how the history of the Great Migration has impacted our community. This is a program that we did based on story circles that we did in the neighborhood. We curated the stories, made it into a musical, had the neighbors do their story, added music, added movement, added food, wine, and it was a great evening. People want to hear their story. The fish fry bringing back the history of how we have come through with a grannynomic development jam. You know, we didn't have a catering hall. We put it in the grocery store in the neighborhood. That's where we produced it. And so when we talk about organizing, the system that we have of identifying our stakeholders includes, of course, the spreadsheet, the handshake. And we talk about our real estate professionals, bringing them in for technical assistance, running for office. You've got to run for office, and you can, and you should run until you win, or as we say, until you're able to buy your own politicians. <laughs> Community benefits agreement, nobody wanted to hear about it at first, and now we're just persisting. Just don't give up. And how do allies? How do allies work together? This is an actual system, which we can share with you. We didn't make it up. Other people worked on it and said, this is what we've learned about how to invest our privilege in working with other neighbors. And so when we talk about education, again, so many ways to do it. One of the ways that we began years ago was just teaching the eight principles. And whether you're teaching it in the garden or whether you're teaching it at the University of Chicago, it doesn't matter. Education lives when you have a commitment to teaching the other person and sharing. And so in the eighth principle, we just want to say that where I came from, and this is my neighborhood, where I actually could walk to well, I was a kid, I wasn't walking to work, walk to, walk to learn, walk to play. The dollar signs were all neighbor-owned businesses within walking distance. The top, the top heart was my house. The second heart was my church. The bottom heart was my school. And it was good. This is my walkable village now. It's also a TIF district. How can we use the foreclosed properties, the vacant lots, and the tax increment financing to reinvent this neighborhood? How can we get our walkable village? That is part of what we're looking at now as we've created 
a brand new Woodlawn Chamber of Commerce. Big didn't create it, but we're part of a committee looking at what is it that can actually work? In Andersonville, which is across town on the north side, they're able to attract uh, retailers. They got a beat beat back retailers because retailers are attracted to these affluent rooftops. But how do we attract the same? How do we not have a Carter that's only filled with the Walmarts, the fast foods, the uh, cell food stores, the subways? How do we have quality corridors where we live? That's the process we're engaged in right now. And we ask you to uh, work with us, see if this is something that resounds with you, um, this walkable village, uh, this increasing household income, uh, this uh, neighbor-owned, neighbor-driven process, and ask yourself, at the end of the day, where are you coming from? Because I come from white gloves and mud, and I come from Martin and Malcolm, and I come from the underground, listening to the whisper of the wild. I come from light broke in on me by degrees. I come from a world that works for everyone with no one and nothing left out. I come from start with what's in your hand. I come from the home economy, the first economy. I come from spinning and salt, and then the British are gone. I come from sweet, sweet potato pie. I come from believing is seeing, and that I am my vision fulfilled, and that, yes, we can make an oasis wherever we live. And of course, I come from So when you're out there doing what you do, where are you coming from? And point of fact, we all come from this pale blue dot called Earth. And we're big because you are. Thank you. So thank you. Um, thank you for something that is really inspiring tonight. I, I don't say that often that things inspire me, but both of you have inspired me and, and continue to think about how these systems can and will change and how we work in neighborhoods and with people and putting, make really being people-centered, which I think is one of the most important things that we should take out of a lot of our work is remaining people-centered. And place will follow, performance will follow, planet will follow if we remain people-centered. We can, we can get to those things. So uh, just real quick, I wanna ask both of you, Within looking at creating these systems, um, what are some of the biggest impediments that you find in your work to you know, getting this wide scale, widespread level of change to be able to work for it? Um, so I think, um, one, Naomi's absolutely right. I think we've said it a couple times, right? Systems, the systems that are in place, mm -hmm. uh, the policies that are in place don't work. Uh, I, I think one of the big, personally, one of the biggest challenges is that our um, policies, they are bad policies, and our leaders know that. They actually know that. What they don't know is the solution. So the, the impediment is people, I think, recognize the problem. They genuinely don't know the solution. So um, the challenge for all of us in this room is how do we begin to identify solutions and use those solutions to transform it into what a policy change would look like and then advocate for it so that we go, so we take action into, and, and make it systemic. And I think that's really hard. So, um, so I think one of the impediments is real transformational change takes time. We live in a world where time isn't what people give you. So how do you balance that? <laughs> right. That I think is one of the biggest challenges. I would say from where I sit, uh, it's capacity building. I think that, um, as I mentioned, that um, money can cure a multitude of challenges. And when we think about uh, all the work that there is to do, 
Um, so many of the organizations that I work with or know about are operating on a shoestring, bootstrapping it, and believe it or not, Blacks and Green is an all-volunteer run organization, and we have um, a, uh, uh, of course, a, an amazing cadre of allies and supporters, um, organizations who sponsor our programs from time to time, but largely uh, the money is, uh, is just missing. I think that the issue of how strong our institutions are in our neighborhood is a function of um, how, uh, how we can attract the best staff, pay the staff what they deserve to be paid, and uh, the, so the opportunity is to replace me, for example, as a really, really I don't know, C plus, C minus executive director with someone who really, that's their thing. They are paid to deliver. There's enough people to do the work. And from organization to organization, there's abundance to tackle the challenges. Thank you. So I'm going to ask a selfish question. Um, how can cities and municipal government in particular better support this kind of systemic change that has a place-based element to it? Um, because often, to be true, you know, sometimes we folks don't know what to do or don't know how to help or we use the tools that we've always had. So we use the traditional tools and if all you got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's right. So, you know, how can governments, whether they're, you know, local, county, state, like what can, what can really be done in order to, to, to help these kind of processes? Well, one thing is um, don't compete for the same dollars that your community organizations are going for. I mean, that's not a, that's not a competition a community organization can win. Are you, are you getting me? Okay. <laughs> uh, the second thing is, you know, when there are standards for financial um, underwriting, gifting, um, either you're going to recognize that there has been a structural imbalance that, have, that has depleted capacity and you're willing to bend the rules. Do you know how many rules were bent for the banks to do the mortgages that they did? Okay, bend back over in the other direction <laughs> for neighbors and community organizations. So that when major funding pools are coming down the pike, don't say, well, those of you who are qualified for a bank loan, come and get it. You've got to create new criteria, new structures. Nobody wants to give money to someone who's just gonna fritter away or lose it or fool's gold or whatever. But can you create an actual structure that allows people to do the work with funding and uh, management support. Maybe it's a new kind of thing that doesn't exist. Pay people, put the money in the neighborhood, stop competing with community organizations for the same dollars. I think the other thing I would add, if, if you're talking about how, how cities, how community, how um, institutions, municipalities can help, I think first, they gotta really listen really listen to what's going on in communities. You know, one of my big takeaways is, you want to know how to solve a problem, ask the people who live it every day. They'll tell you how to solve it. But then there has to be a, because what happens is, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But when you say, hmm, I'm going to try a new tool, the minute you get stressed out, you become uncomfortable with that tool, so you get back to the one you know. And every department in the city of Pittsburgh today has the capacity to change. What happens is, when it gets uncomfortable, we regress back to the tool we know. So, you know, what can housing authority do today that's different, that isn't impeded by the laws, right? What can permitting do today that isn't impeded? I mean, the list can go on. What can the workforce system do today that isn't impeded? So that means, one, a willingness to really listen, to understand what's at the core, 
and then to ask what can I do differently and when it becomes uncomfortable because I don't know how many of you like to be in an uncomfortable place <laughs> right none of us do that voluntarily well in, you know institutions are the same way and have the courage to see it through and not worry about the political implications mm. right and I think that's where cities and I think that's where municipalities can make a difference. They have to be willing to do that. There's lots of capacity in city government and municipalities to do things differently. There just has to be the willingness to move those systems gradually. Um, and I think that's, you know, Justice, you and your role, your ability to be a bridge between what's happening in our neighborhoods and communicate it so that those tweaks can happen, that's the opportunity. Got one, because I think you, I did it that way because okay. he said selfishly, right? Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Very good. <laughs> so I actually have a question. Um, I get, I'm holding the mic, so I, I get to do what I want, right? <laughs> There's been a lot of talk that actually I've heard it a bunch of times, that this uh, the concept of the secret sauce, right? It was, it was in the video. You, you brought it up. And so um, I'm wondering if the secret sauce for, for both of your work is around this really ambitious vision that you've laid out for your communities. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to how you arrived at that. What is that point where you said, this is, this is how we have to do it? You know, I, I mean, obviously there's, a, there's a, a life of work behind that, but if there's something where everything just kind of came together, where you are working systemically, you are, you've integrated all these different ideas, how, how have you been able to envision that? What, is there anything that contributed to your, to your ability to do that? Well, I would say, number one, I grew up in a walkable village. And so the idea that there was a, there was a concrete way to know that something was possible and, um, and then the decades in between um, of suffering and the churning and the watching it just sort of disintegrate. In my lifetime, the African American walkable village has gone extinct. Okay? So, um, so I would say seeing the example, experiencing prolonged pain, <laughs> and, um, and then uh, recognizing that here, here, here's what it boiled down to, if, if I'm understanding your question. I got so uncomfortable that I said, I don't know what it's going to be, and I don't know what it, whether it'll work or not, but I'm going to do something. I'm going to try something. And I came up with what I could think of. Everybody will come up with their own thing. Um, whether it's uh, at the vortex of their uh, skill, passion, you know, uh, who's to say? But um, the the just the, the just the just the burning desire to see something better exist. So, and I, I would argue that um, she she's spot on, right? So, grew up in Beachview, right? Not a lot of resources but the greatest way to grow up ever, right? We didn't have cash, but we had lots. It had nothing to do with money, and we did have a garden. We had all that, right? So one, what are the core values that we share? And you gotta define those. And I will guarantee you, if we did a process, right, if we did a conversation mm -hmm. right now, we'd all end up with those same values. If you anchor something in those core values, it's not so important that you come up with the right solution, but that you come up with a solution that we're all willing to take the first step in recognizing that we might have to make some shifts along the way, but it's gonna move us forward, right? So identify those core values, come to a shared agreement about where you're gonna set your priorities, and then, and this is where people panic, right? Put the stake in the ground, and then move it forward. And too often, that's where people get a little bit timid, right? And they don't put the stake in the ground. And putting it in the ground, there's not a right or wrong stake. Okay, uh, or whatever we're going to use. It isn't that it's right or wrong. It's that you take the first step and you adjust along the way. Because if you have the right core values, 
You're not going to you're not going to freak out when it doesn't work. You're going to sit at the table and figure it out. And I can tell you, we've had and I'll use Northside as an example, right? I've got I mean, we're having great success because we collectively identified those core values. I've got two communities who went down a road without defining those core values, mm -hmm. and I will tell you once once um, once resources got put on the table, it started to fall apart because they didn't identify their core values and work from that place, and distrust started to bubble up. Mm -hmm. So this stuff isn't easy, but if you come from a place of consensus around what you want for your community, mm -hmm. you can then begin to move forward. And just to echo on yeah. that, when, when, when we uh, propagated these, uh, the grannynomics, those are those values. Yes. Yep. Those are those values, and we figured that, you know, almost anybody, no matter where they come from, you know, could identify that those were things that were good for people to feel, believe, think, or do. And uh, in our case, we wanted to make sure that African Americans understood we were environmentalists. We're the first environmentalists. By the way, you all are all African. Y'all know that, right? <laughs> I love saying that. I like it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so to be able to tie your consciousness back in through where you came from uh, makes it less mysterious, less hoity-toity. Yeah. It's just living in harmony. Uh, and that's why we call it the beautiful life. So w please give it up. Oh, okay. Um, I have a simple and a complex question. Um, first, are you available for the 2020 ticket, uh, Buco Davis or Davis Buco? Thank um, and the second part of that question, you can decide which one is simple and which one's complex. <laughs> and that is, um, you both speak to this one issue, which is how can we design systems in which you see and feel the suffering of others when you benefit. That oftentimes when we design things or we have things, we don't get to see the suffering. I get to benefit and I don't have to live with the consequences. So from your design perspectives and community, at least one example of which you can design something so that you see the impact or have to live with the impact of the decision you create. I'm not, did you, I, I, I didn't fully understand the question. What's the question? So my question is, what is something that you can do when you design, so for example, um, part of our economic system is built on the suffering of others, right? I, or, or right. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, the gentrification. Mm -hmm. So if I have the means and resources and I can move in an up and coming community, I don't have to see the fact that people got displaced. Right. Got and it. so I'm wondering how can we design things so that you can see that actually when you benefit, somebody is also losing out. Well, you know, that is the $64,000 question. Um, of course, I came up at a time when 64000 was a lot of money. So yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I want to upgrade that, uh, the seriousness of that question, because it's part of what's fundamentally wrong with the Help the Negro industry is that um, a, an entity has money and has a good heart, or maybe doesn't have a good heart, uh, but they have a plan, or, or maybe they don't have a plan, but they have access, and they can do something that at least makes sense to somebody. Um, it helps always uh, when you live in the place where you're doing the work. Um, when you are not living there, the way, um, you know, the way in is, is, is what we've already heard. There's really systematic, frequent, ongoing communications, conversations. We like to have food and wine when we're having a community conversation. We like to have, you know, story circles where we're just giving people our undivided attention for two minutes while they share how they feel or where they've been um, going. The commitment always comes first, though. You can, there's nothing you can do to um, 
transform the pain of another person if, you're, if that's not really the game you're in in the first place. That's one of the reasons why we talk about increasing household income. But well, we don't have it down yet, not even by a long shot, like the research, the funding to do, what's the baseline household income, how are you tracking, how are you evaluating, what are the metrics, what are the levers and dials that have household income increasing or whatever outcome you're targeting. So um, specific uh, targets, you know, face-to-face -face communication, being in the place, that's, those are all essential ingredients, wouldn't you say? I would agree. And you, first of all, you ask a, you're asking a really big question that has lots of dimensions to the answer. So I would say, I agree. And I would say first, you got to create win-wins. So first of all, create the win-wins. And start, uh, and this is again, and the reason it's so big because not everybody's going to go zero to 60, right? So you got to start with those who are ready. And there are lots of people mm -hmm. who aren't ready for that. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot, I'm looking at a bunch in this room today, who are. So you create win-wins with the people who are ready. And then you grow that. And over time, those who are not, that, they, that shrinks. You know, I say this all the time in the North Side. I'm like, in term, because there's some people who don't want who are, have very nice lives in the north side, right? And um, change isn't really what they're looking for, right? And I said, look, over time, their world will get so small because ours is going to get so big right. that they're, they're going to either come on board or leave, right? And not that I want anybody to leave because my belief glass is half full, is they're going to come on board. So my point is, you, you can't, you got to start with those who are ready. You got to do incremental. You got to create, we've all have to create win-wins. We're in the problem we're in today as a country because there are winners and losers. And, and every human being has the right to a win. So how do we construct those? And that's what I think has to be the first priority, and, and then incrementally how you do it. So we're spending a lot of time in the North Side thinking about how we increase household incomes. And I, you know, I can give you a couple examples, but I don't think you know, we have time. We got, we got our, we got our, I'm gonna anyway. You like that? <laughs> do your thing. Quick, do your right? Thing. So you know, our hospital has agreed to change the starting age, working age, from 18 to 16. We're gonna get kids part-time job starting as young as 16. We've done the data. We know who in that hospital who are residents of our community who are, have some education, but not enough to advance to the next level even within the hospital. So the, the local community college has agreed to put degree programs together to move them up. And the hospital is going to carve out, give, give protected time for those workers in their work day so that they can take the courses that they need to take. And they're going to provide stipends to underwrite the costs. Okay? And there are jobs that need filled. So we're going to take workers who are underpaid, get them the little bit extra, and then they're going to rise up. Okay? And, and again, thank you. I mean, you know, and again, I, I don't get credit for any of this. I got to say this. I'm not smart enough to come up with any of this. I'm a good listener. And talk to the people who live it. And that's how we figured all this out. But what's important to that is those are three, those are two systems. A hospital system, they literally said, wait a minute, what do you mean? I said, there are lots of kids at 16 who need jobs. They're like, wait a minute, why can't we, why do we have 18? Is there a legal reason? No. Oh, let's change it. Boom, right? So behavior change, behavior change in CCAC, right? This is good stuff. And this is what I mean, start with those who are ready. Figure out what the, small, what the solutions are and build off of that. Because our theory is we're going to get this right at AGH, and we're going to go down the route to people's gas, and then we're going to, you know what I mean? And we're going to incrementally right. grow this. Right. And, and at different levels, household, and why do we want to do that? Because we want the 16 to 18-year-olds to get those entry-level jobs. Because let's face it, you know, $10 an hour at 20 really stinks. But $10 an hour at 16? Rock it. Hey, you got it, sister. And it's, a, <laughs> and it's a good reason to choose an alternative to the underground economy, right? Right, right. Boom. So it's incremental.
That's and, what I'm saying. And I, and I would add to that, yeah. uh, which is, because we're talking tactically as we should, but there's a soft tissue uh, answer as well, which is, um, lives in my own personal experience. I went to Jewish prep schools. I went, I went, I like, I went to my neighborhood, public school, went to Jewish prep schools for junior high and high school, went to an all black college uh, for university, then you know, went to law school. Again, different personal social immersions. If you are not, if, no, if, ever, if all of your friends look like you, I'm just saying, there's an opportunity for you to randomly, if necessary, find someone who doesn't look like you and go to dinner, take a walk. It lives in personalizing because they're not a them anymore when you love them. They're a me. They're an us. And, and, and I'll tell you, you know, so many really, really smart, caring people who are across town from me have zero understanding of what it takes to make it through a day in the life of an African-American person. Um, you come to my neighborhood and you see what it looks like and they all look like that and I, I you know, if I came in from another planet, I couldn't understand what in the world is wrong with people who would live in a place like this. There's so much to understand. And you can only really feel, to your point, you can only feel the answer to that unanswered churning by getting right here, by getting right here, okay? Go to dinner with someone who you seem, who seems strange to you. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's one to grow on. <laughs> so please give it up, <laughs> Naomi Davis, Zaina Buko. Um, so thank you. Thanks to Diana, Naomi, Majestic. Thank you for being part of our village, for sharing our values, for coming out. I know it's been a hard couple of weeks. We can do this together. We are all empowered, not slowing down, and moving forward into the future um, to make things happen and, and in our communities. I just say to Jenna Kramer, where are you? Jenna, woo, shout out. Woo. You are rocking sister, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, we'll see you in February. <laughs>